Good afternoon from the USA, everybody. My name is Jonathan Bradshaw, creator of Meetology. It's a pleasure to be your moderator for this very timely session. This session is stay healthy, stay secure. What to know before you go. And in this case, it means go means travel. It means flying. This session is presented by Laurie Dankers, spokesperson for the TSA, the Transportation Security Administration. In this role, she's responsible for explaining TSA programs, procedures, and priorities to reporters and key stakeholders, publicly representing the agency's position on transportation security matters and overseeing security-related outreach. Slowly but surely, as humans, we are beginning to travel more and more, and certainly domestically within the US, um, many of you on this platform will be doing that, or at least looking to do so very soon. Laurie has the answers as to what you can expect. This is a 30 minute presentation. If we have time, we'll do some Q&A at the end. As Laurie is speaking, please feel free in the Q&A section, not the live chat, the Q&A blue tab at the top. Feel free to ask questions through that and I will put them to her if we have time at the end. Laurie, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me here today. I'm, I'm honored to be able to speak to your group and talk a little bit about what TSA has been doing during the spread of the coronavirus to ensure that people can travel, stay healthy while staying secure. So I do have a presentation for you that I'd like to share, and I'll go through that with you right now. So once again, stay healthy, stay secure is what it's called. And it is... Uh, I'm not able to advance. There we go. So first of all, I wanted to point out that we do remain uh, committed to ensuring that those who are traveling can do so uh, and have a lot of confidence during that travel process. Uh, not only do we wanna make sure that you stay healthy, but we also wanna make sure that we never compromise security when we have these new procedures that have been put in place. There's really four elements to what TSA has been doing, and I'll go through each of those individually. The first one is we all have heard of social distancing and when you're at the airport, it's no exception. You should do that as well. You're gonna find signs in the queue when people are entering the checkpoint reminding uh, travelers to socially distance. Our officers have been encouraged to social distance whenever possible when doing their job. If you're going to come in contact with the TSA officer, they're going to social distance from you. Uh, and so do keep that in mind. A lot of times when people come to the airport, they forget to do that. But once uh, they have the signs and the reminders, we're hoping that's the case because we do know that social distancing is part of what keeps people healthy when coming through the airport. And that includes actually the entire airport process, not just in the security checkpoint, but do keep that in mind. It is that six, six foot recommended distance. Here's the kind of places you'll see that not only at the tables where you're gonna be removing your items to prepare them to go through the x-ray, but also if it requires a bag check. Also, if you're going to be waiting to go through the body scanner or the walkthrough metal detector, please remember to keep your distance, both from our employees and the travelers around you. Another one that's been a really big one for us at TSA is taking opportunities where we can reduce physical contact. What does that mean? First of all, you're going to find acrylic barriers in place at hundreds of airports. Some of those are installed by the airport. Many of those have been installed by TSA. In fact, we had a pretty significant contract that we issued in during the summer months and airports have had those acrylic barriers installed around areas where our officers and employees come in the most close contact with the travelers. At the Traveler Doll, travel document checking podium where people present their identification and boarding pass. Also in the bag check station or in areas where people are preparing their items to go through the x-ray. We wanna make sure that our officers have that space, that we have that extra layer of protection. And as a traveler, you should know to expect that when you come to the airport. Another thing is when travelers come to the security checkpoint, they're going to be asked to scan their own boarding pass. The readers have been turned in such a way that you'll take either your mobile or your printed boarding pass, place it on the scanner. Uh, the information on your flight and your name will appear for the officer to verify. And that is one less touch point between our employees and the traveler. Another thing that I want people to remember is that some airports were actually using new types of technology. 
Uh, in the far left, we have computed tomography, the, the CT scanner. It creates a 3D image. It allows our officers to get a better view of the contents of carry-on luggage. By getting that better view, we're able to reduce the number of bag checks that we need to conduct. And that goes towards the touchless approach. Uh, the middle one is a, a, a coming. It's not very widely rolled out right now, but you will find it at two airports across the country. It's the enhanced AIT, which is the body scanner. It's a uh, new technology that we're using. A passenger stand, comes in and stands in the body scanner. And if they're not standing properly, our officer will be able to tell them that before they are scanned, which then allows the traveler to adjust how they're standing potentially reducing the need for a, a, a pat down. And so that's what makes this new technology touchless. It's another way that we're moving towards that, ultimately uh, that touchless experience. And the credential authentication technology uh, pictured on the right is rolled out in dozens upon dozens of airports across the country. And here's how that works. The traveler will insert their ID or scan their passport themselves that a scanner is attached to the secure flight network. So we're able to pull up the traveler's uh, flight information, their name, and any other information we need. The TSA officer will not need to touch the traveler's ID. And in doing so, that is a full touchless experience. Also, if the credential authentication technology is in use, a traveler does not need to show a boarding pass. So if a cat unit is in the checkpoint we're going through, you're gonna be responsible for inserting it. But keep in mind, you will have that touchless experience. So that is a really uh, great news for our employees as well as all travelers. Now, there's something that, that we know that you can do when traveling that really does help make the experience touchless. And that is make sure you don't bring those prohibited items to the security checkpoint. Uh, we have a lot of resources at TSA that are available to help travelers know what is and what is not allowed. One of them is using our My TSA app. There's a feature on that app that allows you to enter the name of an item in the can I bring section, and it will tell you whether that's allowed in carry-on, check luggage, or it should just stay at home. So there's really no excuse for people to bring uh, these prohibited items to the checkpoint. Prohibited items lead to a bag check, and that is uh, in increased contact. And during these times, we do not wanna do that. So please keep that in mind. The other things, if you have belts, loose items, remove all those items from your pockets uh, before you go through the body scanner or walk through metal detector, that will reduce the chance uh, for you receiving a pat down. And the last thing is if you're going through the general screening lanes, the non TSA pre-check lanes and you have food in your bag, please place that food in like maybe a gallon Ziploc clear bag because food is now required to be removed from your carry-on. And in doing so, your food will need to sit in a bin. Now, bins are common use items. I would not recommend that people uh, put their food in a, in a bin like that, that then they're going to hopefully eat that food later. So uh, please put your food in a bag, place it in the bin. For other loose items, place those directly in your carry-on and then there's no need for any of those items to be in a bin directly. Reducing contact is key during these times. Another thing you'll see is our officers wearing personal protective equipment. Now what that means is you're gonna see them wearing uh, surgical or N95 masks. They're going to be wearing gloves. And while they have always worn gloves, there's a couple of rules now related to the wearing of gloves that really are an advantage to the traveler. Number one is if uh, a, a TSA officer comes in direct contact with a traveler's belongings, they're required to change their gloves immediately after that so that there's no potential cross-contamination. The other thing is a traveler can ask a TSA officer at any point during the screening process to change their gloves. So if you don't feel comfortable with the gloves that the officer is wearing, uh, you can ask them kindly to change their gloves and they will be required to do so. The other thing you're going to see is in any position where a TSA officer comes in close contact with a traveler, such as at the travel document checking station, where you're preparing your items to go through the x-ray or a bag check or a pat down, they're going to wear a face shield. That's to protect our employees as well as the traveler. So you will see that when you come into the checkpoint. And of course, travelers are strongly encouraged to wear face masks as well. Now, if a traveler requires a pat down and they are not wearing a face mask, a TSA officer will offer them the face mask and then ask them to wear that. 
That is not only for the traveler's protection, but for the TSA employee's protection. So keep that in mind. Um, I'm often asked um, how many airports do not have a face mask requirement. And the most recent stat that I've seen is about 30% of airports do not have a face mask requirement. So that is more than 150 airports that do not have that uh, requirement in place. But TSA is asking travelers to wear those face masks for their own protection. So please keep that in mind. The other thing you'll see is TSA has taken a very aggressive stance towards cleaning and disinfecting in the security checkpoint. Many airports have contracted for additional cleaning, but we also have officers who are uh, who are looking for those areas that uh, are frequently used by travelers to keep those cleans. They're wiping out the bins if time permits. The other thing that we're allowing uh, or we're having officers do is we have a dedicated officer who works in the checkpoint to make sure that the cleaning protocols are being followed, that the TSA officers are wearing their PPE properly, that they're encouraging that social distancing. And an officer has that as their task during their shift to stay on top of that. And you will see that when you come to security checkpoints. And that is a real confidence booster to know that someone's keeping an extra eye on that. Now, there was an exemption made earlier this spring for travelers who have hand sanitizer with them. Normally, we would limit that quantity to 100 milliliters or 3.4 ounces. Well, what we decided to do is to allow travelers to bring a hand sanitizer container up to 12 ounces, one container per passenger. We know that people will want to have their uh, hand sanitizer with them, not only when they're going through the checkpoint, but when they're in the airport, when they're on board, on board the aircraft, and of course, at their destination. It does no good if that hand sanitizer is in your carry-on luggage during that portion of your trip. And that is why we made this exemption. What you'll need to do if you're bringing a hand sanitizer over the 100 milliliter limit is remove it from your carry-on and have it screen, tell the TSA officer that you're bringing that through. They will do a little extra screening on it. I'd recommend putting it in a, a clear uh, gallon sized uh, Ziploc bag so that it's protected from the bin, but you'll be able to have that with you during your travel experience. And I've seen travelers do that. I've asked them a little bit about it and they say, I would never leave home without it. And they're surely glad that they're able to travel with that larger size. The next thing about TSA pre-check is I really want to make it clear to people that right now, if you are not already enrolled as a trusted traveler, if you're not already eligible for TSA pre-check screening benefits, this may be the perfect time. You know, TSA pre-check has shorter wait times. You're going to spend less time in the security checkpoint. You're going to have that expedited screening process, which is going to reduce potential physical contact. You're also not going to need to remove items such as electronics or food from your carry-on luggage. And the last thing is in terms of your clothing, you're not need, gonna need to remove your light outerwear or your shoes, once again, reducing a touch point. So if, they, if you haven't been persuaded previously to enroll in TSA PreCheck, this may be the time for you to go ahead and do so because of the benefits during the, during the spread of the coronavirus. Once again, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, if you allow, you're allowed to leave on your shoes. You can leave your laptop in your bag. All of your travel size liquids stay in your carry-on. You can leave on your belt as long as it doesn't alarm the security technology. Leave that light outerwear on and leave the food in your carry-on. We have more than 400 locations nationwide where people can enroll. Many of those were closed in the early spring and into the early summer, but they have reopened. Most of them are open full time now, and uh, it's a really a great opportunity to take advantage of it now that things are sent back to normal in terms of the ability to enroll. I can also tell you that several airports are hosting mobile enrollment events in communities where maybe they have a enrollment center that, that has limited hours or is a good distance away, but they're bringing those enrollment centers into the community. So now is the time to check those out and enroll if you haven't or any of your clients or anyone else that you would like to have travel through the TSA pre-check lane. I can't say enough good things about that. So there's a couple of resources I wanna share with you. Uh, this is a video that shows many of the procedures that I've talked about, many of the changes that have been put in place so you can see them in the checkpoint environment. TSA remains dedicated to our mission of ensuring travelers get to their destinations safely and securely. Here's what we're doing to focus on the health and safety of travelers and the TSA workforce. Passengers are encouraged to wear masks and practice social distancing of six feet whenever possible. 
TSA officers are required to wear facial protection and gloves. TSA is installing plastic shielding at various points of interaction between travelers and TSA officers. To reduce physical contact, passengers will keep possession of their IDs and boarding passes, placing their boarding passes on the reader themselves and holding it up to the officer for visual inspection. Passengers may be asked to adjust their masks for identification purposes. Passengers may be directed outside of the checkpoint to remove or repack items like laptops, liquids, gels, and aerosols, and then resubmit their property for screening. Passengers should remove belts and all items from pockets and put them in their carry-ons instead of bins. Food items should be placed in a clear plastic bag and placed into a bin. TSA is allowing one liquid hand sanitizer container up to 12 ounces per passenger in carry-on bags. Officers must change their gloves after each pat-down and screening rotation. They will also change their gloves upon passenger request. TSA has increased the intensity and frequency of cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces and security screening equipment, including bins. If you have any questions, please contact us at Ask TSA on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, or visit tsa.gov to learn more about how to stay healthy, stay secure. I will make sure that uh, I pass on to the organizers the link to this video this you, so you can in turn share it with your clients and customers. I know that uh, it's very helpful to be able to see these procedures in place and that video does a really great job of doing that. Another resource that we have for you is this infographic that really does summarize the four elements of the stay healthy, stay secure effort. It talks a little bit about the social distancing, the acrylic barriers that are in place, tips on reducing the physical contact, as well as the cleaning and disinfecting and highlighting some of those elements. So once again, you'll be able to um, have access to this to be able to share. It's very, very handy to have. So there's a couple of other things I'd like to share in our last few minutes. Uh, one is about Real ID. For those of you who are unaware, uh, the, the Department of Homeland Security extended the deadline for Real ID to October 1st, 2021. And what Real ID is, it establishes minimum standards for the issuance of state issued driver's licenses and identification cards. And essentially after October 1st, 2021, for those who wanna come into the security checkpoint, they need to have a real ID compliant driver's license, photo ID card issued by a state or another acceptable form of identification. And here is a list of those. While that seems like it is far away, I can tell you that it is not. The original deadline for real ID enforcement was October 1st, 2020. Due to the pandemic, there was a one year extension and that's where we find ourselves now. Most state DMVs are open, so travel, uh, people who are interested in getting a real ID license are going to be able to go in and do that. But please take note of this deadline. It's going to be very important. And then this time next year, I hope I don't find you standing outside the security checkpoint because you didn't have one of these acceptable forms of identification. Just something to think about. So um, I have a graph that I want to share with you. Um, every day TSA posts on a tsa.gov slash coronavirus web page. Uh, the most recent number of travelers screened by TSA. So we're always posting the previous day's numbers. And what I did is I took that data and I made a seven day rolling average. If I was to show you the uh, actual raw numbers of people screened, it's really a series of peaks and valleys because our busiest days are, are Thursdays and Fridays. And then again, Sundays and Mondays with our slower days being Saturday, Tuesday and Wednesday. So it's hard to draw a trend. But by taking a seven day average, you can see how since April 1st, uh, we have uh, had a dip in the passenger travel. The first circle is represented um, the days around April the 14th when TSA screened the lowest number of people in our history, just slightly over 87,000 nationwide. The second circle was Memorial Day. And you can see how passenger volumes continue to increase in those weeks from mid-April to the end of May. And you can see that on a rolling seven day average, we were just under uh, 300,000 people per day. So there had been a nice recovery. 
The third or the middle dot there shows the 4th of July holiday. And as you can see, there was a peak and that was the most number of people that we had screened up to that point. And it coincided with that holiday, not surprising. And in fact, our busiest day up to that point was the Monday after the 4th of July when we had screened 755,000 people. And so that's a far cry from the middle of, of uh, April. The fourth circle that you see actually represents Labor Day. We were very close to a million passengers over that weekend on Friday before Labor Day, which was September 4th, 968,000 people were screened. So you can see, we continue to see the passenger volumes rise. And the fifth circle that's almost off the chart is actually yesterday's screening numbers. It is our busiest day since the onset of the pandemic, really the height of that, the mid-April period when 984,000 234 people were screened. Once again, that even though we're in the fall months, which tend to be slower travel months, we're seeing people come back and travel. And to further illustrate that point, I created this chart as a month by month comparison. As you can see, May, June, July increases month over month. Even August was very similar to what we saw in July. September was a slight decline. But look at the first days, uh, 12 days of October. When I compared those to the first 12 days in September, we're up 15% over where we were last month, which is really encouraging because we're actually seeing people come back at a greater rate, despite the fact that this is usually not a peak travel time. So I'll make sure that you have this presentation. You can look at some of those stats more carefully if you'd like, or check out the webpage that has this data. But don't let anybody tell you that no one is traveling. I can assure you based on these stats that people are traveling, they're returning to the airports, they're returning to the air. And we hope that that, that trend continues and we'll be continuing to watch it at TSA as we work hard to stay healthy and stay secure. And that brings my presentation to a close. Uh, there's my contact information. If you wanna reach out to me, feel free to do so. Also my Twitter handle. And if I can't answer your question, I'll make sure I put you in touch with someone who can. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Laurie. Um, yes, I can testify as someone who flew back to the UK and then back through Dallas to here in Oklahoma in Tulsa. Um, yes, quite impressively busy actually, very, very, uh, very hopeful in terms of travel. The Dallas was relatively busy, much more than I thought. So yes, the American American people and the international audience coming to the U US, um, slowly getting better, certainly um, domestically. Yeah. Um, I could also testify to the TSA pre-check as a British guy who's on a green card here. I don't think my green card was the reason I was able to do it. Anybody actually from the UK certainly, and there's I think many, many countries can apply for that P uh, TSA pre-check. Let's help me save hours, I suspect, all told, going through Dallas Airport, which is where I go through a lot. But we've had lots of questions coming in, Laurie. Um, yeah. I'm going to start, I've got a big bank of them here. Let me start um, with a, a, an interesting one. I saw, um, it's about uh, travel corridors. You may not know this to be fair, but do you see travel corridors being set up between countries and the USA in the near future? That's a great question, but I'm happy to tell you it's not a TSA issue. Yeah. Keep in mind that we screen passengers who are departing domestic U.S. airports and travel corridors is something that is all abuzz. And I know uh, we've had several media inquiries related to that, but the Department of Homeland Security would be the lead on that, not the TSA. I was I'm not surprised to hear you say that. OK, um, do you think we have a future where your test results or vaccine status could be integrated into the pre-check or global the global entry database or the the, the, the pre-check uh, system essentially so when you arrive in the same way as it knows who you are quite automatically uh, using some of this software it will also know your coronavirus status yeah, so TSA is not conducting temperature checks on passengers. I know some airports have chosen to do that. Airlines have chosen to do that. TSA has not done that, and there are no plans to do so. Um, in July, there was a multi-governmental report issued called the Runway to Recovery, where it addressed the issues of temperature checks. It did not address the issue of testing. And at this point, there are no plans to integrate that in any way. But that is certainly something I'd be glad to pass on to the, to the individuals within the agency. I just let them know that there is interest in questions related to that, but it's not something that's happening now. Okay, I'm gonna bang through these, we've got so many. Um, do you foresee most airports installing thermal screening for passengers? 
Well, that would be an airport decision. I know that they work very closely. Airports do. They're, they're watching what each other are doing to see if they can build in another layer of security, another layer of comfort for the travelers. And that would be outside TSA's purview. Once again, we're responsible for the security screening. We put procedures in place that we think are adequate to protect our employees, to protect the travelers. And so that is where that would stop. If an airport chooses to do that, we'd be happy to support in any way, but it would not be something that would be conducted in the security checkpoint. And that's an important distinction for travelers. Okay. Um, it's a sort of rhetorical question in a way. The question is, should passengers leave more time to check in and go through security with the new measures? Well, I guess the, the answer probably is yes. How much time would that be in your, in your view? Although I have to say, in my experience, because fewer people were traveling, the queues haven't been bad when I've been traveling in the U.S. So there's a couple of factors that are in play. First of all, with fewer people traveling, you think that you probably can just come in at the last second and board the flight. I would not recommend that. TSA is keeping additional lanes open in the security checkpoint to encourage that social distancing. So there is going to be more space for travelers, but that doesn't mean come late. The other thing is that the peak travel times that we're seeing have, have been modified a little bit because the flight patterns have changed. So we do see that early morning rush usually a late morning rush. I don't want people coming to the airport, potentially missing their flight and not having backup options because they thought they could just sail right through. Our wait times continue to be low, but every step of the process does take longer, whether it's checking your bag or boarding the flight because the processes are different. And for many people, they're unfamiliar with those processes. And that's why that I don't recommend coming late. But with that being said, don't come to the airport two, three or four hours early. That could increase your risk to potential exposure. I would say that 90 minutes to two hours would be adequate prior to flight departure. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, one that's come up, global entry, comma, updates. Um, maybe you should explain what global entry is and updates. It, it, it's uh, Yes, it's something that I know has got more limited access than uh, availability, should I say, than TSA PreCheck. Can you tell us more about it and, and how it works, perhaps? Sure. So Global Entry is a trusted traveler program that is uh, administered by a sister agency to TSA within the Department of Homeland Security. U.S. Customs and Border Protection has Global Entry. It has Nexus for people who are traveling across the northern border and Sentry for those who are traveling across the southern border. Those are land crossing. So global entry is for people who are coming back into the country um, from an internet on an international flight. It allows you expedited clearance into the country. It's a pre-enrollment process as well as an in-person visit required. It's really in parallel and completely separate from the TSA pre-check enrollment process. But the reason people enroll in global entry is one of the benefits is they would be eligible for TSA pre-check and expedited screening when departing the US, when going through the security checkpoint, whether for a domestic or an international flight. So that's why a lot of times global entry questions come up relative to TSA pre-check. I can tell you that many of the global entry enrollment centers were closed during the pandemic. And so there is a backlog right now trying to get people cleared and approved for global entry. If you are in that situation, you may want to consider enrolling directly in TSA PreCheck. The cost for that is five, uh, $85. It covers a five-year period, and you'll be able to get an appointment in short order, and usually within a week, uh, you'll be approved if, in fact, you are eligible. So the global entry issues are separate from TSA and TSA PreCheck enrollment, and if you're kind of in the in the in-between area now and not sure what to do, I would highly recommend enrolling in TSA PreCheck directly, coming back from an international trip on an international flight. CBP, Customs and Border Protection, has made the mobile passport app available that will expedite you into the country. Uh, you will go to uh, a separate kiosk to be able to do that. And um, I would, uh, there's no cost for that. So there's a lot of options out there. I hope I've kind of described them in such a way that would be helpful to you. But Look up mobile passport, see if that's right for you. Enroll directly with TSA for TSA PreCheck, and you'll be on your way with that expedited screening and expedited clearance back into the country. Thank you, Laurie. I'm going to make this the last question. It may not be something, again, um, that, that directly uh, relates to TSA. Some international airlines are implementing rapid testing. Um, do you foresee that being something being done on every flight? Now, I'm very much aware you're not on the aircraft, but do you work closely with the airlines? Perhaps that's a better question. Does the TSA work closely with the airlines to decide where 
certain um, jobs can be done, i.e. Uh, within you know, airside or, or you know, uh, on the plane, perhaps in this case. Do you yeah. liaise with the airlines and, and how, how does that work? So I would have to just defer on that because TSA is responsible for screening the passengers going through the security checkpoint for domestic or international flights. That would be separate from TSA completely. And that's something you would have to address with either the airline industry groups or the airlines directly. It's not something I can speak to or would even speculate on. Understood. Laurie, I want to say thank you very much. No one will know this, but we had terrible technical difficulties until about 40 seconds before we went live. You've been an absolute pro. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for bearing with the technical issues we had behind the scenes. And uh, yes, thank you for coming and sharing your considerable knowledge uh, in this area with our audience today. Well, to thank you so much. You are pros and I really appreciate being here. And please, if you have any other questions or I can be of further assistance, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. And to everybody watching, I'll say have a great uh, last few sessions on Planet IMEX. Explore the pre-recorded sessions, watch them on catch up, uh, and I'll see you at the next session very soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.